Thanks very much uh, for the introduction, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to talk today with uh, uh, Basil Abbas and Ruan Aburam, who are two young artists, as you can say, based in Ramallah and New York, and who have been actually uh, working since a few years together. And we're here to talk about sound practices. We choose this uh, term rather than sound art uh, in order to defend uh, a very experimental approach and the research-based uh, art that is uh, uh, typical of your, of your practice, which is actually linking vin video and sound and not only being focused on the, the sound uh, itself. So what is interesting in your work is that you both come from backgrounds which are different than visual arts. Uh, Basil is coming from uh, music and Ruan from filmmaking. And so maybe the first question is, how did you see those two practices coming together in your, in your work? Um, hello, hello, yeah. Um, basically, I think, um, I think tr two things sort of drew us together to work. Um, I would say formally the idea of the sample and um, you know sampling things and uh, using them to sort of um, I was doing it with sound she was doing it more with film so the, from a formal perspective I think that's that's the sort of one point that sort of brought us together um, a meeting point and then the other was more from a political or um, you know we were sort of we were sort of um, trying to find a new sort of uh, language or a new way. We were both sort of, I think, frustrated with the limitation of a medium, you know. Um, so I wasn't, you know, very um, content with just sort of being, uh, working with sound uh, or music by itself. And I felt there was so much more to explore and there were so many things that I could do. And Ruan sort of, we, shared those sort of uh, feelings, I think, right? Yeah. I mean... Absolutely. And I think that um, we were also trying to, to, to find a, you know, a different language to think about our experiences coming from Palestine and to, and to do so through new mediums um, was, was something quite significant. So there was a kind of synthesis in our practices. And it opened up, you know, very different possibilities to what we could do when we were thinking about them in relation to each other. So in a way we could say that the question of collecting, sampling and remixing material that can be considered as common to both the practices. And what I find very interesting in your work is that uh, in fact those issues are linked with political um, aims, which is like a critique of the situation in, in Palestine and also a way to uh, involve again with the notion of experience and improvisation and a collective uh, kind of meetings around performative practices. Um, there's quite a few things there. I think on, on, in some way it was very natural for us to work with the sample or with the fragment, largely because our experiences in Palestine were so incredibly fragmented. There was also this impossibility to ever have kind of continuous line of vision, which I think you, you, you really sense in our work. And, and that's something that we experience both quite physically and psychologically there in the sense that, you know, quite literally sometimes your line of vision can be blocked by a military structure, but at the same time, you have the possibility to even, you know, imagine a different way of living or being is also blocked. So in a sense, you know, so much of our work is about that kind of incompleteness and uh, thinking about that incompleteness as something that has a lot of potential and, and working with fragment and gesture and sample um, allows us to do that. And it also opens the possibility of thinking of this kind of multiplicity of experience, this multiplicity of times that we're constantly um, thinking about. Uh, in, in a way, and, and, and it's also you know, impacted us formally because we were really interested in um, a lot of, you know, did, when we were younger, kind of digital approaches to image making and to electronic music and, um, and how that kind of, you know, allowed us to get out of certain set languages that already existed, certain aesthetic and oral languages. It already existed. Existed so. and exhausted, 
you know, both in the media and even, in, you know, in artistic circles and, you know, sort of visual and oral production was sort of stagnating. You know, you were the, the, the sort of potency of the situation had sort of been lost because of repetition. Um, so what I mean is, you know, whether it's um, an image of a checkpoint or an image of a soldier, um, especially during the second intifada, the images were circulating so much that they had completely lost their potency, even though they were very potent situations. So I think our search for trying to kind of bring back that potency and make it sort of uh, speak again to, 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 to something was also very important for us in a sense. Um, and because we're speaking about sound, then, you know, sound allowed us to really sort of think about <clears throat> to, to think about how one could denormalize or bring back a potency to a, to a certain situation. Um, yeah. To destabilize images, to destabilize kind of conceptions, and, and um, sound allowed us to do that, but also sound really allowed us to think about the significance of the body, because so much of what we are experiencing um, is really experienced at the level of your body, you really feel it on, on your skin. So, you know, when you're crossing something like, um, like, the, like the example of a, of a checkpoint, I mean, you feel that, you know, even your body is taken over. And I think that really impacted us and impacted our practice. And in a way, that's affected how we think about sound, but how we also think about our practice in general, all our installation practice. It's um, very much about also the bodies of people in this space and how that kind of activates the work because it's you know it's a it's a very it, it takes on a very physical um form with the frequencies that we're um working with so yeah there's this specific uh, piece of yours which is a light and sound installation called the contingency from 2010 where you really take the sound material, the sound recording from the checkpoints uh, in Ramallah. And uh, so there's a, a very strong statement about the way sound today is an instrument of colonial power to condition yeah. the behavior. And yeah. so, but what is also interesting in your practice is that you, you reverse the weapon in a, in a sense, uh, insofar as sound itself has an unpredictable behavior in space. It's something that doesn't, that crosses borders and that Absolutely. goes through even physical uh, bodies and uh, through vibration can really impact things on a uh, infra language yeah. uh, level. So For sure, I mean, uh, as Rowan was saying about the lines of visibility being broken, when you think about sound and frequencies, you know, they are able to, per, you know, penetrate, penetrate yeah. these spaces and penetrate these things. And we really started to think about that a lot. And we basically both were studying in London and came back and, um, you know, I lived, I lived close to, um, between Ramallah and Jerusalem actually. And by the time I got back, even though it was only two, three years, the wall had come up, a lot of structures had, you know, they were kind of movable checkpoints that become permanent borders right now. And a lot of work had been done sort of about the landscape and how it's changing, but then we started to think about, okay, what if we thought about the soundscape and how that's changing and how that could. And that led us to that work. We started sort of recording in very lo-fi kind of microphones, obviously, you know, recording, when, every time we pass the checkpoint, we record using these small recorders. Um, and you have to imagine that this is like a border crossing where you don't actually see the soldier. So this, the, the soldier is there, but they're speaking to you behind like a, um, like a speakerphone. So you're amongst, you know, you go through one turnstile, you go to the one next, and they're screaming at you and telling you, no, you turn left, no, you turn right, no, you do this. So you don't actually see them anymore. It's just through sound and the turnstile. And, and it, also, wasn't, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. it no. wasn't a much like... What I wanted to say was it wasn't as much as kind of trying to reproduce the checkpoint or, any, or anything, but it was more about the checkpoint experience itself had become so normalized. Uh, and the image of the checkpoint becomes so normalized, like a mundane thing. So it was really us trying to denormalize it. And by looking at the sound and looping certain sounds and taking out certain frequencies, we were able to make that experience sort of strange again or denormalize the whole experience of the checkpoint, I think. But it also, I think, really made us think very much about how 
you know, sound has a very strong kind of physical presence and structure. So it, it you know, thinking about how it's part of the apparatus of any kind of colonial structure and power and how that has a certain kind of materiality to it. Um, I think that was a very significant moment for us in terms of how it influenced the rest of our practice. Um, so we were really interested in, at, at that time to think about how sound, you know, what's the relationship between sound and power, but then how do people actually subvert that and, and in, in a way that's how our interest in kind of music and certain kind of musical forms um, also emerged and kind of evolved. So they have a relationship to each other because we're not just interested in how kind of, you know, how colonial power would use that sound. We're interested in how can we subvert that and how are people subverting that in a sense. So it's an interesting thing with the kind of this idea of frequencies penetrating spaces and, you know. There's something very specific about the auditory space. That's mm. something that uh, McLuhan mentioned in the 60s. That is about this idea of a public space, a shared collective uh, real-time experience. And this is also something that is a very important aspect of your work, the way you deal with, uh, in fact, destroyed, placed uh, in Palestinian, and, um, and how you, in fact, are interested by uh, those uh, daily rituals of uh, singing, dancing, practicing music uh, as, a, as a resistance, as a form of resistance. And I think your work that is present, presented here in Art Statements is based on this uh, inquiry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> being, we're being very good, there's not much overlap. Um, uh, I, I think in a way, yeah, exactly, I think we're, we're really interested in the, in the possibilities for there to be a kind of collective moment again, or a collective body, especially when you're thinking about the body as something that's really broken now. I mean, are you thinking about the physical body or you're thinking about the communal body? Uh, especially in, in the Middle East, it's, it's actually one of the sites of destruction. It's something that's being directly attacked. Um, and in a way, then trying to, ourselves through our practice, activate that kind of communal body, but also being interested in moments when people are doing that. And that's part of the reason that we, um, in some of our works and in our future work, we're, we're really interested in, in these kind of yeah, these very everyday moments of ritual where people are coming together and it could be in a street wedding, but in that moment, through those kind of sets of rituals, they're forming a kind of common body again. And I think that um, that is also something we try to do through our installations, through the way that people might engage um, with our works, which can be uncomfortable at times. Um, but there is that sense of, you know, that, that somehow the people in that space in that moment can also a common body in a way and uh, and I think that also influences why we still do performance uh, and, and we try to get out of kind of set spaces for contemporary artists um, because we're really interested in that kind of engagement we're, we're interested in what you can kind of make active again um, yeah in a, in a way did you want to add something that's well, I just wanted to add that actually, like the, the, the it, you know, we were interested in those collective moments that were happening through sort of dance and ritual because it also, when we, we actually started collecting this material online and at first we really didn't know why, we were just very attracted to this material and just kind of amassing it. And then it sort of dawned on us at some point that basically these increasing sort of um, moments that were sort of being uploaded online, it could be someone filming someone singing in their living room or you know and it was really increasing especially in the last three four years it seemed like a real sort of response how we started to see it was a response the people's response to their erasure you know and when you think about syria and iraq and and what's happening right now in the erasure of entire communities um, things start to sort of make sense and we start to see these performances as the last thing that people hold on to if, if that makes any sense yeah now to uh, talk a bit about your practice, I mean, on, in, on the artistic, you know, fabric of, of your objects, of your uh, practice, um, there's a, an important part given to, in fact, concerts and uh, audio-visual uh, performances. 
uh, you do have a, a group. Uh, can you talk about this? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, basically, we, we have a performance group that we, um, with a third person who's a musician and also an MC. And it's kind of been important for us for many, many reasons. W one, one, uh, one reason which Ron just mentioned is to allow us to move outside of the museum and gallery space, but you know, to do maybe a mu music festivals, to go to a bar, and especially, you know, in Palestine, for example, it's, you know, the crowds are kind of separated, you know, so, you, you know, the museum crowd or the gallery crowd, etc., is a, you know, upper middle class crowd. And I think it's, it's true everywhere. I yeah, mean, it's a exactly. And so, and so you're, you're able to sort of reach other crowds and, and that's really important and speak to other people. And, you know, because if we're just speaking to ourselves, then, you know, um, it's not, not very useful at the, at, the, at the end of the day or very impactful. And then another thing is that it's been a great source of us for actual experimentation, you know, because what we usually do, I mean, there's a high level of improv involved, but everything kind of comes out of a body of research that we're researching. So usually it's kind of like we bring our sort of, we sit down, we sort of come, we talk and we say, well, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? How can this sort of speak together? We loosely sort of define some parameters, some things that we're looking at, and then it's improv. And so many times what happens is from that improv, uh, aesthetic and oral language, like a sort of aesthetic and oral language starts being produced and coming out, and then we use that in our installation or sound and video work, um, and then vice versa as well, I think, right? And yeah. then improv, yeah, I mean, eventually it started to really inform how we work because, how we work on our installations, because even a lot of our sound is actually like recorded live and then sampled, so like, you know, we would both be on like synthesizers, jamming literally, and then like recording hours of synthesizers and things, and then sort of listening back and sampling your own material. Um, I think we've arrived to that point yeah, now. Yeah, I think where that kind of live um, element, that, that, that possibility to improvise is something that um, has been really important for our practice and how it evolves and how we're constantly um, trying to evolve the actual language. So it's, it, it's, it's a kind of space for us, to put the performance space that doesn't have any set rules. It feels far less confined. Uh, uh, and it's also obviously very ephemeral. So when you do a performance, it's nothing is set in stone. So you, you can experiment and it can go not how you want it and, and it's okay. Um, but I think that sense of composition and, and improv that definitely also impacts how we think about the relationship between different elements in our installations, because they are made up of various different elements in a sort of composition. So I think that's something that somehow... Yeah, so, I mean, you start to treat the images that way and the objects that way, and, you know, and then I, I, just to add one more thing, basically the, you know, with sound, when, when, when sound moves from sort of analog to digital, you know, you had the sort of you know, the one and the zero, right? And then sort of nothing in between. But now the, the, the equipment and the things have become so, um, you can do ones and zeros, but there are betweens now, you know, and that's really important because that's sort of brings back the sort of physical, natural human element in, the th in, in yeah, it, you know. Not, not to say that the one and zero is bad, but I'm just saying, you know, to yeah, be able to move between them is very important, I think, and, you know. Yeah, we work with a lot of errors that happen in the recordings or glitches that then remain as part of the work. So. And so this also has an incidence on the way you display your installation, you install them uh, sound-wise. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, the way you tune basically an art piece in a specific space. So that's also something that comes from the practice of music and concert. Absolutely. Live concert. It's really, it makes, well, it, it, in the visual arts, people are sort of nervous about that usually because you're like, you know, what do you mean you're changing it, you know? But we really, really like work spatially and sound is really a spatial, physical, I mean, the way we approach it is a very spatial, physical uh, thing. And, you that know, response, sound response to any structure. So it, and it, response it, to know. space. So you need to tune the sound in the room if you're looking for, you know, if you, want, if you want the feeling to be here, you need to tune it in the space. If you want it to be up here, 
you also need to tune it in the space. It's going to be different if I play it here, if I play it in a smaller space. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we go with our, a lot of times when we install, we go with our stem tracks and we tune things in the room. I mean, absolutely unusual, but we do it. But it also then, in terms of our installations, when we're showing them, we also like to then very much adapt them to the space and, and kind of always introduce even a small gesture that's coming out of it being in that site. And I think, I, and, and maybe now that you're saying it, it does come from how we were tuning the sound in the space. So it's something that's throughout our whole practice now. Um, and I think it gives it a kind of vitality. It gives it that kind of liveness for us at least so it doesn't feel that it's static. Because we're very worried of static works that just kind of end. Um, so that's something that I think we're always resisting and it's obviously difficult um, because what's demanded of you is a certain kind of staticness. But I think it's something that we are constantly trying to you know, pu push back on in, when we are kind of showing the work. So one could say that uh, the exploration of uh, non-linear time, mm -hmm. which is uh, also characteristic of the way you, I mean, we can see a few examples on the screen now, you mix the images uh, in space and time and, and through also loops, which actually create a kind of endless uh, time structure. Um, is not very compatible with like the single uh, screen yes. uh, projection, like uh, like a program as an event. Um, but also something that um, uh, yeah preserves a form of openness. That is something that you politically want to to keep in your work, um, really? uh, which is always evolving depending on the context and creating interaction. Uh, with with the context and with the with the visitors. Um, also, I think something that is uh, that plays a role is your use of uh, archival material, and that also concerns both image and sounds. And of course, as a form of Warburgian uh, way of uh, considering all this in terms of how your composition and and uh, mixage work would reanimate the the history and, and, and in a very humble way, in a way, puts it uh, in, a, in a common uh, today experience? Um, I, I think that that really comes out, you know, of, I think it starts from a, a you know, it, it starts from our direct experience in Palestine where we, you know, felt very like, like you know, experience was getting extremely ghettoized and, and, um, and we also felt very stuck, you know, in any given particular moment. Um, but really what, what, what we became more and more interested in was, you know, the connection between different moments and different spaces and, and how they can overlap and, and resonate. Um, and that has evolved, I think, you know, across our projects in the sense that um, we're constantly working in those kind of slippages between times and, and, and between places and, and, and what you end up with um, is a very different understanding then of the moment that you're, that, you're, that you're living in because it's all about how can we how can we engage with the moment now but not in a way that is totally subsumed by just the present or just kind of looking Pass. back towards a kind of um, historical moments, but really making those moments live again. So it's, 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 it's in a way this feeling that things don't really end, that there is this kind of accumulation. Um, and, and that's why we became very interested in kind of the idea of returns, so the idea of figures returning in various different forms, they appear as different characters. And, and that's something we really explored in the incidental insurgents. And, and in a sense, those kind of things that loop and accumulate. And, and, and if you think about sound, it loops and it accumulates. And if you play a sound in a space the whole day, there's an accumulation of that sound. It doesn't sound the same at the end of the day. So even though know? it's looping, it's also, there's something that happens in the accumulation of the loop. So it's not just a repetition. And in a, in a sense, that really relates to how we're thinking about time. It's, it's not a repetition, but there are these resonances, kind of idea of resonance that can be full of disjuncture and, and but you know, so that, that's something we're very interested in. We're very interested in it as a possibility to, to, to have a different imaginary for our present, you know? And I think um, also formally within a sort of installation practice, you know, we don't really, you know, our, 
our works are built as loops. So, you know, it's not a beginning, middle, and end, but really multiple beginnings, multiple middles, and multiple ends. That so there's a certain sense of cycles that happen, and the loop is very important. So even though we're screening a video today, we're not, we don't usually screen our videos because the end is connected to the beginning. It's also and incomplete. They, like, and it's incomplete, you know? absolutely. So in a sense, it's kind of significant. That a kind of incom it's an incomplete narrative. And if it's an incomplete narrative, then it's one that we're still writing and that there's still a possibility of inter interjecting into. So that incompleteness, I think, went off there, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so ca can you say a few words about the, the work that is presently exhibited that has a, a specific collaboration with performers, in fact? Um, uh, the one that we're going to work uh, on? Yes, the mask. Oh, okay. The one that's here. Here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was mentioning the one uh, here. Yes, at, okay, uh, okay. In Basel. Hola. I'll do it, I'll do it. Okay, well, <laughs> the... the <laughs> The project we're showing right now in statements um, is called And Yet My Mask is Powerful. And there are obviously with many of our works, there are many threads um, in the work, but we, um, we basically arrived at a moment where there was sort of so much violence happening in the region. And for the longest time, we were sort of looking away from it. And I feel like we arrived to a point where we had to sort of just face the violence and look at it. And we came across a poem by Adrian Rich called Diving Into the Wreck. And, you know, in it, she, um, in it, she's kind of talking about literally wearing a scuba diving mask and diving into the water, into a wreck. Um, and it really sort of resonated with us because, you know, in it, she kind of talks about how I'm here for the wreck itself and not the story of the wreck. Um, and you know, it made us sort of, um, at the same time, you know, there was all these young Palestinians who have been for the last three, four years, I think, um, making these trips back to destroyed villages inside Israel. So, um, and they would just go. And it was really interesting for us that, you know, they would go and either have picnics there or sometimes to the point there are some villages where people went back, they renovated the church and they use it every Sunday. So it became a sort of... Uh, semi like semi return to the space and what's really interesting is that you know what we wanted to do was to start to think about the site the, the site of the wreck as a sort of a potential to, to sort of project something else into it or uh, uh, as a potential a kind of virtual time what we were interested in was like how these young people were going back and they were projecting something that they were they returning exist, to somewhere that and it they've never been. And, and it doesn't exist now. So it's, and it's not necessarily going to exist in the future. So it's this kind of virtual time. Um, and, and, and so, the, so the, 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 the video and sound piece is really comes from those trips that we took together. And I think that's also a big part of our work, which is like very often working with young people there. And we're also young ourselves and, and also the acts of sharing this experience together is as important as the Yeah, outcome. so we didn't document the spaces of the wrecks, but we were basically, first of all, it was about taking those trips, you know, whether we made a, a work out of it or not, it was something else, you know, but part of the work was actually taking those trips. And we, what we tried to do is capture the visceral experience of going to these places, uh, as opposed to sort of documenting the spaces, I think. And that's what we tried to do. I don't know if it worked. Uh, maybe we can take a few questions. There are any from the audience? In the um, in the new work, there's a part where it says it's going from green to black to white or something. Can you? I don't understand. What was that about? Can you tell me about that? Um, that was, um, basically there, there, there is this part where the person is nearly blacking out. So this, and in the poem, it's literally because she's diving into the water and, and, and the deeper you go, the and the deeper that you go, obviously you're losing oxygen. And the thing that saves her is the scuba diving mask. And we were really interested in that because we're thinking about the mask in a very different way. Um, 
and 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 for us, you know, when we were reading about the mask, it really made us think about, you know, being anonymous, being different people, taking up different positions, um, which is kind of really an important political space now, and it's something we were obviously working on in our last project. Um, and so it was really interesting for us to think about how this kind of blacking out can be thought about in relation to some, somewhere like Palestine, where you, you could, in various different ways, be blacked out or lose consciousness, but somehow um, the mask you, is using to. this kind of mask, this possibility to take up different positions is what, you know, um, gives you a kind of space in a way. And um, yeah, I could talk a bit about the mask. Well, she describes, while she's diving, she describes the mask as what's giving her power, basically, to, you know, and we sort of took that and... Is that probably because you live in two different parts of the world at the same time, kind of, or...? <laughs> yeah, I think this kind of... Uh, that's, yeah, being outside that's, and inside. Yeah, and, yeah, being in this kind of in-between, in-between spaces. It's a reversal of the question of erasure, basically, and like positively, like erasing one's own identity. Absolutely, as a as a space positions. that kind of really, uh, mm. uh, you know, liberates you from a lot of things at, at at this moment. I mean, even if you think about a moment where, like, you know, it is an hyper individualistic moment, or even as an artist, it's all about you as an artist. This idea that you could become anyone, and um, conceal yourself and and, and uh, it, it's it's very evocative I, I think so anonymity as a space is one that's kind of you know significant for us and we've been thinking about for a while and well as you think about the internet and surveillance and it's also very significant of the times I mean you know um. I was also thinking of what you said earlier that um, at first, you you was you were not able to take images. You took sound because uh, you had difficulties with uh, just uh, shooting images in in, uh, in Palestine. Absolutely. I mean, it's. I mean, in in any situation like that, it's, you know, it's a very conscious decision to, you know, create new images there. And um, you know, in in the beginning, it felt completely impossible for us because it was so totally saturated and, and that's why in a way we were you know working for a very long time with existing materials only um, and there was just only like a specific moment that we began to feel able to shoot to, to create new images now and, and that took a very long time I think. Um, and maybe sound is what allowed us to be able to do that interesting Thank you. Are there more questions? Thank you. Um, following up from Marie's question, actually, I want to talk about. I, I want to ask about the landscape that you created with the small uh, projectors, uh, with the objects uh, selection, and the creating that it, it created a landscape with the objects. So, what was the purpose? What was the agenda behind it? Um, basically, we were, I mean, our, our projects you know, have quite a long kind of research period, and, and um, the final project will have various different elements. But we were, you know, in the beginning, quite literally thinking about what are the objects that could be used to, um, you know, destroy places or build. Uh, things and, and 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 especially because there was a real emphasis in the text with the thing itself. So we, we you know we really start to think about things. You know, not just um, virtual or kind of uh, imagined ideas, but you know the actual um, effect of sight, the actual effect of being physically in a place, the actual effect of touching something, and 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 really thinking about how do kind of living fabrics get destroyed, what are the various different ways? And, and, um, and because we're thinking at the same time a lot about projection in the sense of um, how through projection, um, not literal projection, but projection as in how you can um, project different possibilities or you know, how you can uh, project a certain kind of version of yourself 
into a story or into a narrative. And, and in a sense, there can be that kind of gap between what actually is and what could be. And, and, and we became really interested in how we could take these tools and make them somehow inoperative. And when they be stopped being operative and they became kind of things, then you could cast them into these ambiguous um, projections. So it's not really clear. So it could look like a landscape or it could uh, at, at, at points, you know, allude to something a little bit more violent, maybe something more menacing. And, and so we're really interested in that kind of gap between, you know, this what is and what could be all the time, you know? So, so that's a very interesting space uh, for us. And then each composition um, that we're working on really responds to a specific site that we went to. So uh, one composition is for one of the villages and the other um, is for... And not through the visual material, because the, the visual material is a mix of multiple trips that we took, but more through the sort of... The actual composition of... And the, the composition, so how does that kind of relate to that site or this site? So, so our experience of going to the site. Yeah. I would like to ask you, how do you see the sound practices now and how does it go in, in museums? Is that important for the museums or is it difficult to do something? Um, or how is that? I ask you that because I work for a museum in, in South America yeah. and we have now a new place for, for this kind of projects mm. and there is very... Uh, very important for the people and people goes and all that but it's everything difficult to to have something special there yeah. and it's a, a small space um, I think we've definitely come a long way so you know three four years ago <clears throat> our installations would be get put next to a reading room and we'd be told oh can you put the volume down it's like a sound piece, you know, why did you put me next to a library, you know, I can't, you know. So this definitely like changed, you know, and people are starting, museums and spaces are really starting to understand how sound works and you can't really contain it. <laughs> um, so you might as well accept it. <laughs> and, um, uh, but at the same time, I think um, it's important like not to, at least for us in our practice, not to sort of... Uh, take sound as a sort of genre that exists on its own, a formal sort of thing that doesn't talk to other things, you know, because when you talk about sound and, I mean, with our practice, it's multiple things. It's not, you know, we, we, we're not sound artists or video artists or, you know, we work with several mediums. Um, but also, um, there's obviously like a trend with sounds now, and uh, um, and I think that can also, you know, many many people who work with sound come from a music background and come from a improv and performance background, and um, the museum can very much sort of uh, constrain that, you know, and sort of put a limit to it, as opposed to allowing it to. I don't know. Did I say something? <laughs> I don't know if that responds to your question. Eh? Yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of room for... I think it's, uh, in fact, it's a very important uh, increasing trend uh, for museum, not only to exhibit, but also to collect uh, sound pieces, also to collect performative practices, and I think this comes together now in this very moment. Um, to me, the difficulty is, in fact, uh, first to respect the fact that many of these artists who come from music and practice visual arts, um, like you, but also like you could think of historical figures like Christian Markley or Hassan Khan or people like that. They are really keen on keeping a different audience uh, for music and have a resistance in a way to the, to the white uh, cube for uh, this, this kind of energy and sense of sharing uh, a collective experience that is very typical of musical improvisation culture. Um, and so this is one of the questions. So we should also take into account the complexity of those practices, the fact that they're composed of many 
gestures that are addressed also to various social spaces and various reception uh, contexts. Um, and also the fact that even technically, uh, as Basil just said, you know, there's a problem of not being able to contain sound and the, the pollution it might occur, you know, in the galleries for um, uh, neighbor works, etc. And the fact also that every sound uh, piece has its own device, that the technical, technical uh, equipment and, and uh, spatial, you know, situation to listen. And this is why I think one of the issues now is about more about listening and the way we listen than the sound itself, which is, for me, totally integrated in the art history now. I mean, if we think of Cage, but even before Cage, where it's very obvious now that the sound has always been a material for modern artists and, and 20th century artists. And now I think it's more about how do we listen and, and how do we create conditions for listening, how listening can be... Uh, a very engaging uh, issue, you know, about giving people agency in a situation where sound control techniques are more and more uh, important for many political reasons. And uh, also acoustic surveillance is more and more present. So yeah, how, how do we take back those um, issues and, uh, and how museum can uh, respond to all, all that is engaged in those practices and not just filling the space with you know, uh, sound art. Okay. I think we're done. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you for so coming. Much. Thank you.